let me say in advance uh, a, uh, a special request for our sister uh, Jill uh, Clayper. Uh, it was a very difficult week for her, and that's the reason why uh, there's no slides today uh, to show uh, for the uh, for the sermon. So please have uh, Gio and Billy uh, in uh, in your prayers. Uh, uh, they're still uh, morning messy and all the rest of the family. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we come together in this prayer with gratitude. We come together in this prayer once again requesting the faithful fulfillment of your promises that your spirit will be with all those gathering in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and along this morning and from the point in the world where this day, this day started and to the point when this day will finish so many congregations like ours are meeting to bear testimony that you live in us, that we live in you, that you have a salvation for everyone and particularly everyone that loves your commandments and do your commandments. In advance, Lord, we thank you for reminding us what is the kind of love that binds us together. For all those of us that are present, I give you thanks. For all those that for different reasons are absent, Lord, wherever they are, your blessing will be with them too, as it is with us here. In Christ's name we will pray. Amen. Today's text in, in John can be clearly understood as a pre-Pentecost announcement from Jesus about what we now know, the pouring of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and disciples. And we are getting closer to the liturgical uh, celebration of Pentecost uh, in June. Luke recorded Jesus' last words before his ascension to heaven in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 7 to 8, saying, The times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority. It is not for you to know when they will be, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witness for me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It is also uh, the Gospel of John, the one that uh, gave us this preview and the only evangelist mentioning that Jesus gave the Spirit to the apostles when once he was uh, resurrected, appeared to the disciples. No other evangelist mentioned this before, what we all know as the festival of Pentecost according to the book of Acts. Though not using a direct mention of the Holy Spirit and the consequential empowerment, it is only John the evangelist, as I mentioned already, who gives us such a promise even using another powerful binding element between the Father and every faithful disciple. The word that gave the editors of the Bible the clue to entitle verses, the verses that we just read, the promise of the Holy Spirit, and particularly in verse 16, is the Greek word parakletos. It's a compound word in Greek. The prefix para means from close or beside. And the suffix kaleo means 
make a call. The paracletos. And properly, the original meaning of the word paracletos means a legal advocate who makes the right judgment call because close enough of a, every particular situation. Paracletos it's the advocate, it's the advisor, it's the helper that we just heard mentioned in the text. It's the regular term in New Testament times of an attorney or a lawyer. Someone giving evidence that stands up in court. It is the base of modern understanding of a person performing the role, you, you have heard this many, many times, you say, well, I'm not a medic, I'm a paramedic. I'm someone that helps. I'm not necessarily a doctor, but I'm one that helps. And how many times we have seen this title, I'm a paralegal. Yeah. I'm not a lawyer by training, but I'm someone that helps in the process, in, in, in a legal process. So the paracletos is this understanding of the Holy Spirit as our advisor, as our helper, as our advocate, advocate before God in Jesus' name. Paracletos was translated as we just heard as help. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. Now that's the understanding why in this part of this gospel the promise of the Holy Spirit was given by Jesus. Five times in our text this morning in the gospel Jesus made reference to agape love. In verse 1 if you love me, agapate, you will obey my commandments. In verse 21, it mentions four times, whoever accepts my commandments and obeys them is the one who loves me, agapon. And then in the last part of verse 21, my father will love Agapetesai, whoever loves Agapeso, me. I will to love, again, Agapeso in the future, him and reveal myself to him. And I have already mentioned to you, and I will do it today again, how in the Hispanic culture there are so many first names based on all these wonderful Greek words. And that's why we have first name for Agapito and Agapita. Because they agape love. Ancient Greek philosophers identified four forms of love. Kinship or familiarity, a storge. Friendship, philia. Romantic desire, eros. And self-emptying or divine love as agape. Modern orders have distinguished further varieties of love. Limerence, or in French, amour de soi, or courtesy love. Non-Western traditions have also distinguished variants of symbiosis of these different states of love. Love has additional religious or spiritual meaning, notably in Abrahamic religions like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. This diversity of uses and meanings combined with the perplexity of the feelings involved makes love unusually difficult to constantly define compared to another emotional state. So, what could be a lesson from this Gospel text this morning for us on the sixth Sunday of Easter. The word love can have a variety of related but distinct meanings in different contexts. 
Many other languages use multiple words to express some of the different concepts that in English are denoted as love. One example is the plurality of Greek words for love that we just, just uh, heard that includes agape, eros, uh, philia, and uh, the one that I just uh, mentioned before, the story. Cultural differences in con conceptualizing love does doubly impede the establishment of a universal definition. So sometimes if we are expressing love, we or somebody else could say or ask, well, what kind, what kind of love are you talking about? Although the nature of essence of love is a subject of frequent debate, different aspects of the world can be clarified by determining what is not love. Antonymous of love, that is not. Love as a general expression of positive sentiment, a stronger form of like, is commonly contrasted with hate or neutral apathy. As a, a less sexual and more emotionally intimate form of romantic attachment, love is commonly contrasted with lust. And as an interpersonal relationship with romantic overtones, Love is sometimes contrasted with friendship, although the word love is often applied to close relationships. Further possible ambiguities come with the uses of girlfriend or boyfriend or just good friends. And regarding this kind of contrast, I remember one a scene in the uh, in Disney animated movie, the, the Beauty of the Beast, of some years ago. And th there's a, a, a moment when someone is offered to do harm to the beauty's father. And then after pausing for a moment, when this particular uh, character is offered to do some harm, to this, uh, to this man, he paused for a moment and they said, oh, I think you like it. And then he said, well, I don't like it. I love it. <laughs> so he meaning that he was loving to do harm for the beauty's father. For me as a native Spanish speaker, that was kind of a problem to understand that situation, but it happens in every, in, in every language. Mm -hmm. For example, in Spanish, if you like to say that you like something very much, you do not necessarily use the word love. You say, yo amo hacer eso. You will say, me encanta. As a, an equivalent of, I love to do that. I like that very much. I am enchanted to do that. <coughs> Abstractly discussed, love usually refers to an experience one person feels for another. Love often involves caring for or identifying with a person or thing. You'll never vulnerably and care theory of love, including oneself. For example, narcissism. In addition to cross-cultural differences in understanding love, ideas about love have also changed greatly over time. Sometimes historians take modern conceptions of romantic love to courtly Europe during or after the Middle Ages. Although the prior existence of romantic attachments is attested by ancient love poetry. And that's why when we are looking for someone to love, for a partner, for the kind of romantic love, we use this kind of courtly figures. We are looking for a princess. We are looking for a prince. 
Sometimes we're, we're, we're kissing toes. You know? <laughs> we're kissing frogs. Is that my sweet prince? Is that my sweet princess? And this is also a very contrast to, to, to me. Because politically, we wanted to get rid of uh, all forms of monarchies. We want democracy. We want republics. Uh, we want uh, states with parliaments or some other forms of government. We don't want kings or kings. But nevertheless, in, in our romantic expressions, we could say, you are my king, you are my queen, you are my princess, you are my sweet, charming prince. You see the contrast? The, uh, the, com the complex and abstract nature of law often reduces the scores of law to a tough, terminating cliché. Several common proverbs regard law, for example, for the Greek philosopher Virgil's, love conquers all to the most recent and famous from the Beatles. All you need is love. Da, 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 da. All you need is love. Love, love. All is all you need. From my time in the 60s. St. Thomas Aquinas, following Aristotle, defined law as to will the good of another. Bertrand Russell describes law as a condition of absolute value as opposed to relative value. Philosopher Gottfried Leibniz said that law is to be delighted by the happiness of another. Philosopher Meher Baba stated that in love there is a feeling of unity and an active appreciation of the intrinsic worth of the object of love. Biologist Jeremy Griffith defines love as unconditional selflessness. Let me say this as a conclusion. In grammar, the verb describes the action between a subject and the predicate. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, Jesus is identified as the logos, as the word, as the action of love, being the expression of a thought, a saying. So logos, that in Greek means word, is preeminently used of Christ, expressing the thoughts of the Father through the Spirit. Agape is a common term used 330 times in the New Testament with regards to a person sharing a message, sharing a discourse, a communication speech. It's a broad term meaning reasoning expressed by words. And in and, and the last slide, I, I will have this, I had this diagram that agape goes down, wants to say everybody, and then agape goes down saying, goes through the entire field of negativity to change it in the space of grace. My sisters and my brothers, agape love is far above and beyond romantic love or sentimental love expressed by an emotional feeling in a heart shape. It, it's, it's really a lot more. Inevitably, in human terms, if, if not the only one, it's one of the mainly symbols that we have to express love, giving a, a heart shape to whatever we like to express as love. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 could be more sense, could make more sense to us regarding agape love as the only one that can meet the Apostle Paul's description. A love that can suffer everything. A love that can believe anything. A love that could do anything. No other kind of love, like Eros, or Philia, or Storge, could ever be unconditional 
and as steadfast as agape. That is the love that binds us. For obvious reasons, we cannot be romantically bleak, everybody here, but with agape love, we can really remove all the differences that we might have. Gender, preference, ethnicity, culture, status, education, everything, only with agape. On a personal basis, my mother's symbol of sainthood is Mother Teresa. You remember Mother Teresa? What a thing, kind of a five feet thing. Not necessarily good looking by romantic standards. No. <laughs> but definitely she was filled with agape love to do so many good things, to reach out for the poor of the poor, to go places. Not an attractive person, instead of, of her physical appearance, but def definitely someone that projected agape love, someone that any one of us could fail in agape love with her, because as she was filled with this spiritual form of love. Agape. And that's also the kind of love that binds us to overcome all of our differences, all of our arguments, something that we really can overcome everything in order to forgive, in order to accept. We are aware of all the biases that we might have. Sometimes we, we confess to ourselves. Well, I, I want to love everybody, but I cannot stand everybody. <laughs> Only agape love could help us to overcome. And for example, the, the other uh, situation in which they say, well, a, a uh, a marriage, in order to be in a, in a good relationship, Christ must be in the middle. And some other person without a spiritual understanding and said, what is the reason of that triangle? What is Jesus needs to be there always in between of a, a husband and a wife? Or the fact that even can be misunderstood for a male saying, I am in love with Jesus. So what are you talking about? Are you okay? Are you feeling love for another man? Well, not for the physical Jesus. The text is very clear. That one who obeys my commandments is the one who loves me. If that person obeys my commandments, my father will love that will love that person. That is agape love. That is the love that binds us all together, despite of all of our differences. My sisters and my brothers, this is our agape love declaration for God through Jesus Christ. This is the I do that we have done during our marriage ceremony when we say, I do obey your commandments. That's my love declaration to God through Jesus Christ. This is the love that really binds us together with the Father, with the Son, and with all our faith communities. When I give place and action to agape love in my life and put on the back, all other forms of love. But inevitably, it will, it will make preferences for me. Let me just leave you with this final thought that my uh, New Testament uh, professor 
uh, Louis Donaldson, that sometimes he used to say, well, I apply my grandmother's philosophy. I only like the people that like me. <laughs> that is not agape love. The agape love is the one that said, I like everyone unconditionally for the love of Christ. Amen. Amen.